So yes, um, once more, welcome to the online talk and discussion on Taoism and sustainability with our contributor, Martin Palmer. He's at the moment in Bath in England. And um, my name is Maya Do. I'm the educational manager of the Afro-Asian Institute in Salzburg in Austria. Um, and I will moderate this evening. Um, the Afro-Asian Institute is a non-profit NGO and a platform for encounter and dialogue, dialogue between the uh, cultures and also religions. And uh, our program, which is open to a uh, broad public, um, is also dealing with uh, environmental and development issues. Um, so that's why we also have a focus series at the moment, which is dealing with religions and, and sustainability. And we already had one on eco jihad and also on Yoruba and the concept of nature. And now we are very happy to also have uh, one online talk about Taoism and sustainability. Um, the reason why we chose this topic is also because we have here the uh, interfaith um, reception in Salzburg and the topic of this um, interfaith reception is Taoism and unfortunately we had to postpone this reception because of the current um, COVID-19 uh, situation but still we keep on um, with our events uh, and focus on Taoism as we also have a philosophical Zoom cafe um, about the Zwangze and this event today. Uh, Martin Palmer is a theologian and author and uh, also an environmentalist. He is the CEO of Faith Invest, an international organization uh, assisting the faith in moving their investment into environmental and sustainable processes. He is also the co-chair of the International Network for Conservation and Religion and the Sidna advisor of the VBF International Beliefs and Value Initiative. Um, he was also the Secretary General of the Alliance of Religion and Conservation, uh, which resulted in this organizations that I mentioned. Um, and um, yeah, he also lived in China, as we talked before, and um, is also a sinologist and translated a lot of books um, from Chinese into English. And yeah, de dealt a lot of, uh, with Taoism. So he also translated works like the Tao Te Ching or the I Ching or the Zwangzi. And yeah, that's why um, I think he's the perfect <laughs> guest here to present this topic. And yeah, I give you the speech to you and I wish to everybody an interesting talk and discussion. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Maya. Um, I don't know if you can all see me. I'm never quite sure what, uh, how these things work, but it's a real a delight. And, and Maya has been a wonderful person to work with. Um, I have to say, having learned a little bit about the AAI Salzburg, it's uh, a fascinating and I think very, unusual organization, something I think we could do with, to be honest, in the United Kingdom. But um, I'm very honored that you've joined me tonight, especially, I'm particularly honored that it's going to have to be in English. You do not want to hear me pronouncing German. That would only be embarrassing for you and embarrassing for me as well. Um, as Maya has said, I've spent really the last, um, I suppose, almost 50 years in the Chinese world. I, I first went to Hong Kong as an 18 year old um, in 1972, uh, to work in a Chinese children's home. And uh, it was a, a, an extraordinary experience for me because frankly, uh, growing up during the Cultural Revolution in China, there was nothing in the British press really. And, and we, we learned nothing in school about China whatsoever. It was a complete blank sheet. So going there was, absolutely fascinating and I worked in an orphanage, a children's home, right out in the countryside in Hong Kong. It was a great privilege to be plunged that deeply into another culture. Um, and I think the thing that, I am a Christian, uh, I'm a, a preacher in the Church of England, uh, but I am also more as much shaped by Taoism as I am shaped by Christianity. And in particular, as we go through this, I hope to unravel some of the the more profound and wonderful teachings that there are within 
uh, within Taoism. Um, but I think the core one for me is the dealing with what we confront in the West, which is two major pro problems. The first one is that we frequently speak about nature as though it was something out there, something that's nothing to do with us, something other than us. We treat it as a commodity to be managed, to be controlled, to be run. Taoism, as we will discover, takes a completely different approach, that we are a part of nature, not apart from nature. I think the second thing that I learnt most powerfully from, from Taoism, and it still engages me deeply, is that there is no dualism. Now, within Western culture, there has long been an assumption that uh, there is good and then there is evil. And we have often put that into ways that have been deeply destructive. So we have the whole issue of racism, and that is based on the good and the bad, the black and the white, to put it very simply in traditional terms. We have also had uh, that within Christian theology, that there are those who are inside the church, they're okay. Those who are outside the church, no, absolutely not. No salvation outside the church. They're, they're damned. They're going to hell, we're going to heaven. And that, that dualism, that polarity, I think, has been one of the most dangerous things uh, in Western thought. And in Chinese thought, as we will discover in a moment, that doesn't exist. And I want to take you now on a, a bit of a journey, if you will come with me, which I hope you will. Um, and I'm going to start with an image, which I'm going to have to hold up. So Maya, you're going to have to tell me whether this is working. Can you all see this image? Does that work, Maya? Can you see it? Yep. Yes. Okay, very good. Now, this, is, um, this was a bag that was made from um, organic um, cotton, which was the bag that we had at the last major meeting of the Taoist Ecological Temple Network um, in China uh, just under two years ago. And it's the symbol at the top that I want you to focus upon because this is the yin and yang symbol, but adapted for environment and sustainability. As you can see, the yin and yang have become both the earth and the world, but also a crop growing, green life, green energy coming. And that's what we're going to explore in a moment. I'm going to now try and uh, share the screen with you. So I hope this will work. Um, we'll give it a try anyway. Let me see what I can do. There we go. So here is a very classic Chinese temple scene with the beautiful flowers growing within it. And always where you have a sense of the sacred in China, you have a sense of being able to speak to the divine. So the cloths that you see hanging from it, these are prayers uh, that are being offered to the gods of that particular temple. And it's, it's that lovely sense that nature is itself something divine, as are we. But nature opens that door for us in a, in a very particular way. Now, I've already spoken about yin and yang. Here is the classic symbol, <clears throat> and it is essentially um, if we put it into very simple terms, it is male and female, it is uh, night and day, it's winter and summer, it's hot and it's cold, uh, it's heaven and it's earth. <clears throat> and each of them is immensely powerful, and each of them would quite like to take over. And the two great myths of ancient China are two great stories about when the yin and the yang got out of balance. Now, the yin, for example, is, is the cold. It's the wet. It's rain. It's floods. And one of the great stories of ancient China, probably going back at least 3,000, maybe 4,000 years, is the story of uh, Yu the Great, who fights a great flood that swarms across, that floods across China in, in uh, prehistory. And he spends 10 years building dikes, carving through great mountains, channeling the water so that it flows. And in this way, he saves the world from destruction, from loss. And 
That's because there was too much yin, too much water. The world was out of balance and he had to put it back into balance. And he calls to his aid dragons who are yang, uh, the fiery element. Uh, he's the male element, which is yang. So you have this sense that the yang is having to put the balance back against the forces of yin. The other great mythological sequence in China, ancient China, uh, is the story of uh, Yao the Archer. And Yao the Archer has to deal with the fact that one day everybody wakes up to discover there are nine suns in the heaven. And as the nine suns beat down relentlessly upon the earth, everything begins to die. And it's too much yang, much too much yang. So using the feathers of a, of a goose, he makes special arrows and he shoots down the eight fake suns, the suns that have arisen out of the arrogance of Yang, if you like. So the great myths depict this struggle. Now, normally, this struggle is dealt with by the fact that in the center of each is a fragment of the other. So if you notice in the, in the whiter stone here, there's a dark hole in the middle. And in the darker stone, there's a light hole. In a sense, each of them contains the seed of their own change, of their own transformation. And the classic example of this is, let us say that you are um, in Salzburg in the summer. It's a baking hot day. It's been hot for the last two months. And you're thinking, you know, we're never going to be cool again. Everything's going to die. We're not going to have enough water to drink. And then one morning you wake up, probably towards the end of August, and there's just that little chill, that little breeze in the air that says to you, oh, okay, autumn and winter are coming. And then you get into the middle of winter. You're in the middle of winter and it is absolutely freezing cold. And it's dark and it's gray and it's horrible. And you think, oh, you know, we're never going to see the sun. We're never going to be warm again. We're never going to be able to sort of sit out and sunbathe. And then somewhere at the end of February, beginning of March, you just get that slight sense of warmth. You see the buds growing on the trees. And you realize that yin will have to give way to yang and spring and summer come. Now, that's the normal cycle. That's the cycle of the relationship between and yang, yin and yang. Yin and yang are not good and bad. They're not evil and, and virtue. They just are natural forces. There is no morality to these forces, nor are they really a symbol of harmony. They are not so much a symbol of harmony, so much as the need to harmonize. And that's where humanity comes in, in classical Chinese thought. We, our role as a species, is to keep the balance between yin and yang. So if there is too much yin, our job is to balance that with more yang, and vice versa, if there's too much yang with more yin. And even within our own bodies, our own bodies in Chinese thought are a microcosm of the cosmos. And there are very famous Chinese um, illustrations of the body as the universe. We are miniatures of the universe, and the universe is a vast version of us. Within our own bodies, ill health is when we have too much yin, so that would be colds, or too much yang when we have fevers. And Taoism is the oldest source of traditional Chinese medicine, and it comes from the belief that you can balance these forces. There is a natural balance that can be maintained. So you have this powerful sense of a balancing act, which is our role, but also a sense that we are, we are simply part of a greater nature. And I'm just going to read from the Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching probably compiled around about 2,500 years ago, is the classic text of philosophical Taoism. It's like a handbook to how do you manage the world um, in a spiritual but also a very pragmatic way. And the great thing about Taoism is that it confronts us with the idea that it is impossible to describe the infinite. We have something like that in Christianity. We have, of course, Thomas Aquinas's famous uh, six proofs for the existence of God. And people get a bit hung up on this. They should really read the Latin because the Latin starts, each one of these six proofs starts with Aquinas saying, that which for lack of a better word, we call God. 
Well, Taoism goes a step further, and this is the opening of chapter one of the Tao Te Ching, written about 2000 or compiled 2,500 years ago. And the word Tao here simply means the way. Tao is the name is the, is is what you call a, a path or a road. Not so much a, 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 a road or a street, but more a path, something that you would follow through a forest or walk across the hills. So Tao means the way, the path. The, da, the, no, sorry, the Tao that can be talked about is not the true Tao. And the name that can be named is not the eternal name. Everything in the universe comes out of nothing. Nothing. The nameless is the beginning, while heaven, the mother, is the creatrix of all things. Follow the nothingness of Tao and you can be like it, not needing anything, seeing the wonder and root of everything. And even if you cannot grasp this nothingness, you can still see something of the Tao in everything. These two are the same, only called by different names, and both are mysterious and wonderful. And I'll just give you one other reading. Taoism's name comes from this word, Tao, the path. And this is from chapter four of the Tao Te Ching. The Tao pours out everything into life. It is a cornucopia that never runs dry. It is the deep source of everything. It is nothing and yet in everything. It smooths round sharpness and untangles the knots. It glows like the lamp that draws the moth. Tao exists. Tao is. But where it came from, I do not know. It has been shaping things from before the first being, from before the beginning of time. So you have this deep, wonderful sense of an enormous cosmic power and that if we are wise, we will follow that path. We will be guided by the natural flow of yin and yang. And our role is to keep that flow going. Now, Taoism is also one of the most humorous religions in the world. It is simply one of the funniest religions in the world. It, it conveys its teachings, yes, through great wisdom such as the Tao Te Ching, but it tells it much more through stories and not least of all jokes. And I had the great privilege of translating um, the book of Zhuang Tse. Now Zhuang Tse and Lie Tse, Lie Tse, uh, sorry, Lao Tse. Lao Tse is the reputed author of the Tao Te Ching. And probably about 100 years later, so uh, 2,400 years ago, a extraordinary character called Duan Tse was roaming China as a kind of freelance philosopher thinker. And he had, um, he, his, his book, his collection of stories is called the Duan Tse. It's, it's a wonderful book. When I was translating it, I used to be crying with laughter because it was so funny. He was so rude at times and so funny. But he tells, he, he likes to play with language. He pushes language until it collapses. And in doing so, makes us realize that language itself cannot be anything other than fallible. It cannot be anything other than a very weak force. And this is his famous story, probably one of the most famous stories in Chinese philosophy and, and tradition. And it's called The Fishes. Now, Zhuang Tzu has this great friend called Hui Tzu, who is the sort of, well, how would you describe him? He's the sort of agnostic atheist philosopher who has to question everything. Whereas Zhuang Tzu just likes to live life. And this is the story. Zhuang Tzu and Hui Tzu were walking beside the weir on the river Hao when Zhuang Tzu said, do you see how the fish are coming to the surface and swimming around as they please? That's what fish really enjoy. You're not a fish, replied Hui Tzu. So how can you say you know what fish enjoy? Zhuang Tzu said, well, you're not me. So how can you know, I don't know, what fish enjoy? 
Wait, sir, replied, I know I am not you, so I definitely don't know what it is you know. However, you are most definitely not a fish. And that proves that you don't know what fish really enjoy. And Chuan Sir replied, Aha, but let's return to the original question you raised, if you don't mind. You asked me how I could know what it is that fish really enjoy. Therefore, you already knew I knew it when you asked the question. And I know it by being here on the edge, edge of the river Hull. So this wonderful fun where basically he pushes language, he pushes ideas. And in all the great temples in China, you will find a fish pond and this story carved on the stonework because it's about what it means to be true, to be imaginative, to be in relationship with nature properly. And then there's another story from Chuang Tzu. And it's about a turtle. And here we see a symbolic turtle wrapped around by a snake. This is the great symbol of the north in China. And the story goes like this. Uh, Kui Tzu, uh, sorry, Chuang Tzu was notorious for hating bureaucrats and officials. He loathed them. But one day, one of the kings of one of the kingdoms of China, there were six at the time of Zhuangzi decided he wanted to ask Zhuangzi to become his prime minister. So he sent two trembling officials, the sort of Goldenstern uh, uh, and Rosencrantz of uh, ancient China, with the task of trying to persuade Zhuangzi to become the prime minister of this small kingdom. And they found him sitting uh, on a river bank with his feet in the mud. And they come up to him and they say, oh, excuse me, my lord, um, I'm so, so sorry. Um, we, we, we've been sent. Would you be willing to be the prime minister? Uh, the king would be so honored. And Zhuang Tzu doesn't look at them. He just continues sitting by the river. And they, they ask him again and say, look, you know, we've really got to go back with an answer. You know, otherwise we're in trouble. And he turns and he goes, OK. Do you know that enormous turtle shell? that hangs on the wall in the great temple in your capital city? I said, yes, yes, we do. Yes, we know. Uh -huh. Well, do you know that that's been there for a thousand years, venerated by your kings? Yes, 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 we know that. Mm -hmm. Well, can I ask you a simple question? Do you think the turtle wanted to be killed and its life shortened so its shell could be hung up on a wall or do you think it would have preferred to just carry on living in the mud of the river until it died a natural death? And these poor officials, realizing this is a trick question, went, well, I, 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 I suppose, really, he probably just would like to kind of go on being alive. Uh-huh, exactly, said Chuang Tzu. So I'm going to stay here with my feet in the mud, and you go home and run the country. So this wonderful sense that Taoism essentially wants to just follow the natural way. It does not want power. It does not want to be running countries. And its great opponent in many ways was Confucianism. Because until Confucianism arrived, most of the rulers, the kings of China, were king priests. They were shamans. They were able to communicate with the gods through ecstatic trances. And in the earliest texts of China, despite the very best effort of the Confucianists uh, to, ex to eradicate all mention of this, uh, you do find these incredible descriptions of the kings going into trances and revealing uh, teachings and wisdom from, from the gods. Amazing stuff. But the Taoists were eventually kind of almost forced underground, or the shamans were forced underground, and became Taoism round about um, 2,000 years ago. So you have this uh, extraordinary culture. Now, then we come to um, Taoism and its, its actual rituals and its relationship with the natural world. And I'll come back to this picture in a moment. But Taoism has a, a very profound sense of our place and it mocks the pretensions of human beings that we are more important than anything else. And the third great philosopher and, and great book of, of Taoism in China is the Lietzi. So you've got the Tao Te Ching written by Lao Tzu, then you've got the Zhuangzi, 
which is written, or, or it's the stories about Zhuangzi. And then you have the book of Lietze. We're not entirely sure when that was written, but probably somewhere between 2000 to uh, 1800 years ago. And in this, there's a great story. Uh, a, a wealthy merchant has decided to hold a huge party, massive feast. And everybody's there and they bring in all the different dishes, the, the fowl, the fish, the meat, the veg, you know, oh, they're all eating till, you know, absolutely full of food. And at the end of the banquet, up stands the merchant and he says, isn't it wonderful that nature, the Tao, creates all these things for us to eat? And everybody kind of goes, oh, yes, 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 oh, how wonderful, yes, 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 marvellous, marvellous, marvellous. But a 10-year-old boy stands up and says, rubbish. You're talking rubbish. And everybody is a bit stunned by this. You know, it's a 10-year-old boy. But the merchant says, I'm sorry, what? And the boy says, that's nonsense. These creatures weren't made for us to eat. They're just made to be, because otherwise you would have to argue, given that mosquitoes like to bite us and drink our blood, and that wolves and tigers, if they can get hold of us, like to rip our skin off and crunch our bones, that human beings were made to feed mosquitoes and wolves and tigers. Now, isn't that ridiculous? Well, so is the claim that everything here was made for us a fantastic turning on its head of the assumption, which I'm afraid runs through an enormous amount of contemporary environmental thinking, that if it's useful to us, it's useful. Now, this picture shows um, an amazing ceremony, um, which took place uh, at, a, at the, at the uh, creation of a new temple, which was the very first Taoist ecological education center on one of the most famous sacred mountains in China, a mountain called Taipei Shan, which has about six to seven million pilgrims and visitors a year. And here you see the beginning of a ritual. And what this ritual then spread out to be was a dance, an amazing dance, on which the Taoist monks danced from star to star to star in the cosmos. They literally left this earth spiritually and danced from star to star, in a sense, finding their place, not just in nature like this, but literally in the universe. And it's that amazing picture, this sense that through the right ritual, we can literally be carried to the stars. We can dance amongst the stars and the planets. It's a, it's a humbling vision in that we get there because we actually enter into the flow of the Tao. But it's also a very powerful image because these priests, and there are women, uh, uh, pre, uh, there are nuns as well as, as monks there, their job is to keep the balance of the universe, which is why when we began to talk um, in the Alliance of Religions and Conservation, with the Taoists about the threat to nature, they got it instantly. They said, yes, that's why we're here. We are here to counter the threat to nature. And this ecological temple became a major, major center. Um, but there are four fundamental principles that under, underpin the Taoist approach towards conservation and therefore towards sustainability. And I'm going to just take you into them. The first one, which is not to do with this slide, is what's called Wu Wei. Now Wu Wei means, and it's a very difficult phrase to sum up in English, uh, I wouldn't even like to try and do it in German, um, it means actionless action. Now what on earth does that mean? Well, in the West, we kind of associate good religious practice with doing things. And Taoism basically says, no, don't just do things like burn incense sticks. Be the difference. And this is how Zhuang Tse describes Wu Wei. Zhuang Tse said, my master teacher, my master teacher, he judges all life. 
but does not feel he is being judgmental. He is generous to multitudes of generations, but does not think this benevolent. He is older than the oldest, but he does not think himself old. He overarches heaven and sustains earth, shaping and creating endless bodies, but he does not think himself skillful. This is what is known as heavenly happiness. And then he goes on later to describe it again. Wu Wei, heaven produces nothing, yet all life is transformed. Earth does not support, yet all life is sustained. The emperor and the king take actionless action, yet the whole world is served. In other words, heaven is not there for us, nor is the earth, but it does support us but that's not why it's there. Wu Wei, a fascinating concept, a very difficult one. We've already explored yin yang, that notion of the balance. And I'll give you an example of this. We held a big meeting in 2009 in China with the UN and the Taoists <clears throat> around the theme of climate change. And we'd had all the sort of formal presentations of papers and we were all bored rigid uh, by these formal papers. And then this wonderful ancient Taoist master, old master Ren, uh, 90 years old, stood up and he said, ah, this is about yin and yang. He said, what these people are trying to tell us is this, oil, coal, gas are things of the earth, they're yin. When we burn them, we turn them into yang, they go up into heaven, they become a gas. This, because we are doing it too much, is disturbing the balance of yin and yang. And therefore, as Taoists, we have to help the world stop turning yin materials into yang by burning them. And the head of the UN delegation afterwards said, I am going to use that because for the first time ever, I actually understood what the issue is. So that's yin and yang in a sustainable environmental context, and a different way of thinking about climate change. Now, sufficiency. <clears throat> this is a very typical scene at a Chinese temple where people come and they believe, uh, because there's a certain sense that Chinese uh, religious hierarchy is probably about as corrupt as the bureaucracy on earth, and you have to choose your gods carefully, but you can bribe them. So if you burn masses of incense, uh, you can actually get a good fortune. And this scene with all the plastic bags, with these huge furnaces, these things on the right here are enormous furnaces where people are just literally shoveling in bags of incense in order that the gods will give them a better relationship, a better love life, a better career, more money, a bigger car, whatever it is, and very much part of that whole consumerist world of contemporary China. And the Taoists were complaining to us. They were saying, you know, we're choking. We're literally choking. There's too much pollution going up in our temples. People are burning money. They're, they're burning rubbish. Much of this stuff is chemical. It's very bad for the atmosphere. And so <clears throat> about um, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, we launched with them a project of you just need three incense sticks. And it's the wonderful photograph that Maya put onto the, onto the brochure for this, onto the flyer for this. One for heaven, one for earth, one for you. And now if you go to many Chinese temples, Buddhist or Taoist uh, or Confucianist, if you try to come in with huge bundles, I mean, people were coming in with 10,000 incense sticks to burn. They'll be taken off you. They will be resold and the money given to charity. But you're only allowed to take in three sticks. And so powerful is this as a sort of image of sufficiency that it has become for the Chinese government a symbol of not over-consuming. And so for the Chinese New Year stamps, uh, about two years ago, this image of just three incense sticks was one of the main images for Chinese New Year, where everybody goes to the temples 
doesn't matter what they believe or don't believe, they're there for good fortune. So this is sufficiency. You don't need to burn a thousand incense sticks. You don't need to burn ones that are as thick as your arm. All you need to be in tune with the Tao, with the flow of nature, is one for heaven, which is yang, one for earth, which is yin, one for you, the balancer. And then there is one other wonderful uh, concept in Taoism, which is diversity. And I'm going to just read to you from the very first ever Taoist statement on the environment as a specific response to the question from uh, Vuvuf, from WWF, you know, what does Taoism actually believe? And this is what they said in 1995, and this has been the guiding principle for their approach towards environment. Taoism has a unique sense of value in that it judges affluence by the number of different species. If all things in the universe grow well, then a society is a community of affluence, of a huge range of different diverse species. And if not, there if there is not this diversity, this kingdom is on the decline. This view encourages both government and people to take good care of nature. This thought is a very special contribution by Taoism to the conservation of nature. So those are the sort of four guiding principles that have led Taoism to become quite simply the most powerful cultural force in China now very much embraced and celebrated by the Chinese government on the environment. And it takes us then to the natural habitat of the Taoists, which is the sacred mountains. There are hundreds of sacred mountains across China, but uh, there are five major ones, north, south, east, west, and central. And over the last uh, 25 years, uh, I've had the honor and, and delight and privilege of working with the Taoists in helping to protect those great sacred mountains. Um, and the biodiversity on those mountains, the sheer range and diversity of nature, is without parallel anywhere else in China. It is quite astonishing. And it's a very, very important part of how the Taoists educate. When we first did a survey of the Taoist mountains of China in the late 90s, on average, the sacred mountains were receiving one to two million visitors, pilgrims, but also tourists a year. Now with the growth in wealth and uh, the speed of transport in China, um, almost all the sacred mountains, Buddhist and Taoist, are now getting somewhere in the region of 14 to 15 million. So we've helped develop programs to protect the habitat uh, and to, to ensure that they are well protected. And um, the ritual you saw earlier was at one of these great sacred mountains, Taipei Shan, not one of the five most important, but the second ranking, uh, where we created a Taoist education center. But this sense of nature and of temple is extraordinary. On a Taoist mountain, the temples are small. They kind of emerge out of the landscape because just as in Orthodox Christian iconography, you are not looking at the saint. The saint is looking at you. So on a Taoist sacred mountain, you are not there as a, as a, a, a visitor. You're there to walk the way and to be observed by the mountain. Whereas if you go to the great Buddhist mountains, they have these huge temples where you have lovely views of the mountain. But they're not in the mountain themselves. They are on the mountain so you can view it. Taoist sacred mountains, you are part of the narrative of that mountain. You are a part of the way while you're there. Very different sense. And this is the sort of example. Here is a Taoist temple. It's quite large for a Taoist temple, but it's kind of coming out of the landscape. It hasn't taken over the landscape. It's part of it. And it is really uh, uh, incredibly beautiful the way that these places uh, emerge. Uh, very different from the Buddhist 
mountains. And we've been able to create right across China uh, the Taoist Ecological Temple Network. There are now over 700 major Taoist temples and monasteries that run ecological projects, that design their buildings on ecological principles, that are actually trying to create a different plan, a different way of being on the mountain, being in nature, being in China, being in the world. And this is back to Taipei Shan and to the very first of our educational centers. This is um, a sacred tree, uh, much revered. Again, this sense that if you put your prayers uh, onto the tree, nature itself can hear you. You don't have to build something vast and large and wealthy. You just need a tree, just a tree, to restore your broken relationships with nature. Now, one of the very first things that happened when we started working with the Taoists is that supported by the Ecological Management Foundation, a Dutch organization with very strong links to China, uh, the Taoists began to create a set of core teachings about what um, should be happening uh, uh, to care for the planet. And the very first such meeting took place in the Qinling Mountains, which are south of Xi'an, the great capital city of China, uh, of ancient China. Um, and these are so typically Chinese. So they don't just produce a book or a piece of paper. They carve the fundamental teachings of Taoism on a stone. And they don't make the stone fit the shape they want. They leave it rugged. So it's, it's not all smooth like we would do. You know, the image of, say, Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments. Well, those rocks have all been smoothed and made to look lovely in all the pictures. No, it's a whopping great lump of rock that was there. And they carved on it their key teachings. And the key action points were to introduce ecological education into our temple programs, particularly in the context of temple construction. There was significance of that being that since uh, the rise in wealth in China, um, something in the region of 1,000 to 1,500 new temples are constructed every year. To reduce the pollution caused by incense burners and related fireworks. Now, not only have they brought in the three um, sticks movement, but they have sponsored and set up businesses to create non-chemical incense sticks. They're all organic natural products now, and that has swept across the, the market. To use our far farmland in a sustainable way, they now grow organic food. To pay close attention to the protection of local species and to sustainable forestry, they are always in the mountains. The Taoists are rural, they're the mountain religion. And they, they, keep a, they are playing a major role in protecting. To use energy-saving technology, every Taoist temple now uh, gains 90% or 100% of its energy from wind or from solar. And to protect nearby water resources, to protect the yin, and to harvest the yang from the sun for energy. That's the Qin Ling statement. And this now shapes the behavior of thousands of temples across China because it's rooted in what they believe, not in what someone from the UN tells them they should do. And then a major program that the Taoists have been involved with is banning ivory, banning um, the, uh, the, the illegal wildlife trade, particularly in traditional, oops, in traditional Chinese. Um, oh dear, I'm so sorry, this doesn't seem to want to stay. I shall, I shall move on to the next one. Um, so the, the ban on ivory has been instigated by every single Taoist organization across China. It's been hugely successful. Uh, we've managed to cut, for example, the consumption of shark's fin by 70%, uh, simply by building it around Taoist values and also using some of the great sort of public figures, the, the great uh, basketball players in China, for example. It's been amazing amazing effect. But um, in the end, Taoism is engaging very deeply with environmental issues. It is reminding us that we are part of nature. It is taking us back into that relationship that we pretty much destroyed. Um, but in the end, it also has a long-term perspective. 
All of the faiths think in generations. They don't think in 18-month campaigns. They think in generations. And the great symbol of the Tao is water. And in chapter 78 of the Tao Te Ching, um, Lao Tzu sums it up like this. Nothing in the world is softer than water, but we know it can wear away the hardest of things. The supple overcomes the hard, and the so-called weak, the strong. People know this, but no one quite believes it. The sage always shoulders the blame and the grief that is why he is fit to rule. He takes on his nation like a world, as if it was the world, and so it is. And the truth is that the truth is often a paradox. And in the end, what Taoism particularly tells us is be sustainable, have what you need, but no more. A bowl for heaven a bowl for earth, a bowl for us. That's enough. Yeah, thank you very much for this great uh, presentation and all the insights into Taoism and um, yeah, its uh, philosophical basis and also, um, yeah, its uh, sustainable concepts. Um, yeah, we are open now for questions. So if anybody wants to ask something, Martin Palmer, so please do that. Or if people have comments rather than questions, I'm sure many of your people will have their own ideas and I'd love to hear their thoughts. Well, either they've all fallen asleep or there is nothing to, to say. I'm very happy to tell some more Taoist stories, if that would be... Also, uh, I have some questions. Uh, I oh, I thought my, I might have some. I had a feeling you might. Go on. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so one question is, because you told, about, uh, told us about the, architect, um, uh, or the architecture of the temple and uh, its sustainable concept. Um, who are these architects and did it change through this ecological project too or are they the same? Uh, it's a very good question. Very good question indeed. Um, one of the great problems back in the um, beginning of the 21st century was with the increasing wealth in China, with a, um, a permission to return to religion, which had been in existence really from the mid 80s, but had not been trusted. Um, but people began to feel round about the millennium that it was okay to be openly religious. And what this led to was a huge burst of rebuilding and restoring temples. Remember, 98% of all religious buildings in China were either destroyed or converted to other use, factories, warehouses, prisons, in the Cultural Revolution. So the damage was vast. And uh, although many of the temples remained ruined rather than bulldozed out of the way, um, they were in a terrible state. And people suddenly wanted to restore temples. They wanted to build new temples, particularly ancestral temples, but also the great uh, Taoist and Buddhist temples. And frankly, they were using terrible material. They were using concrete. They were using steel. They were not building in traditional style. And this was making the temples part of the ecological problem rather than a place for a solution. So. In partnership with some of the traditional architects who treasured the sustainable methods and materials that have been used for thousands of years in China to build using only local materials, renewable materials, mud, uh, wood, local stone, um, we began a movement with architects to create a handbook on how to build an ecological temple. And that handbook in Chinese, obviously, has gone through, I think, 15 reprints and, and re reworkings in the last 20 years or so, or less than 20 years. And it has now become the handbook by which architects are expected to build. Because if the temples themselves 
are not ecological in their building, on what basis can the Taoists teach about sustainable ecology? It has been the development of eco temples has been a major turning point, and it has meant not only does this mean that the temples can be built like this, but because the temples then have to find craftsmen, crafts workers who can carve stone, who can carve wood, who can make um, bricks out of local river mud, um, who, who are craftspeople with natural resources. This has created a whole workforce of, of skilled artisans who know how to build sustainably. So it's not just the temples that are now being built sustainably. You're finding that there are sustainable hotels, eco-hotels. You're finding the sustainable shops and, and uh, office places. It's begun a little bit of a revolution. Now, it's up against the fact that China is building vast, ghastly, anonymous cities all across its land. But the Taoists have actually now built, in collaboration with architects and with local uh, government authorities, uh, three Taoist ecological cities that are low, low key, they're low uh, height, they're not these vast high rises. They involve the preservation of, of natural streams and rivers, uh, woods, they planted woods, they've created areas for recreation. Uh, so there is a real push by the Taoists to counter the appalling, anonymous, vast, ugly cities that China is throwing up. And their feeling is, okay, it looks as though it's a tiny drop into an ocean. But the fact of the matter is that those cities will be there in 100 years' time because they're sustainable. The concrete, high rises, their average life is 20 years. Thank you. This, yeah, uh, Alice uh, has a question, please. Uh, I have one question. It, uh, how is this Taoism now in China? Uh, how looks the political system? Because it looks it's uh, quite tolerant, but we know. But against Muslim or Christian, it's no like this. I would like to to ask you your your experience. How yeah. you now, thank you. A pleasure. That's a very good question, and and, and and not an easy one to answer at one level. The the key phrase in contemporary China about sustainability, about climate change, about environment, is a uniquely Chinese phrase, which is uh, that we need to create an ecological civilization. No other culture is talking about a civilization response. They'll talk about a political response, they'll talk about an economic response, one or two Muslim countries in particular, but also some areas like the Amazon will talk about a religious response, Muslim or, or Catholic. But nobody is talking about it as an ecological civilization issue. And I find that a fascinating one. I think it's a very challenging one to Western assumptions. Um, however, and, and a lot of the energy, the intellectual energy, the practical examples that lies behind that come from Taoism. Because the Chinese government is very pro Taoism. It's not a foreign religion. Buddhism, which has been there for 1800, almost 2000 years, is still classified as a foreign religion and also has the problem for the Chinese that it is um, supported by uh, different countries Japan, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Myanmar. Uh, there is also the whole phenomenon of Western Buddhists, particularly in California. Uh, and this means that there is international interference in the Buddhist life in China, whereas nobody interferes with Taoism. Taoism is indigenous, but has been therefore able to speak, if you like, truth to power, and has been able to push some of the key ecological issues like climate change like biodiversity, like species, species protection, like tackling the illegal wildlife trade. And it's in a fairly unique position because every other religion, simply because they have international links, and of course here we're particularly dealing, say, with Catholicism, where there is now 
a secret agreement between the Vatican and the Chinese Communist Party about um, who appoints bish uh, bishops and cardinals in, in China, which is working to some extent. But yes, you're right, there is a massive persecution. My, my son and my daughter-in-law uh, were journalists in China, my son, for 15 years. Uh, they both had to leave because they, they helped break the story about the Uyghur concentration camps in Xinjiang, the, the concentration camps for the Muslims of the Xinjiang province. Uh, there is a massive clamp down there. There is, uh, it depends, of course, in which province you're in as to how severe the um, clampdown on religion is. Officially, uh, no um, person who is not an adult, i.e. 18 years, can go to any place where they can be educated officially about religion. They can go to temples, they can go and pray in churches or mosques, but they cannot be taught about it. And in the majority of provinces in China, that's kind of, you know, they'll turn a blind eye. But in some provinces, like Guangzhou, uh, sorry, um, um, hmm. I'm trying to remember, the, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten the name of the province. There's one central Chinese province where there has been a massive clampdown on religion. I mean, really a brutal clampdown on religion. Um, so it differs from area to area. Of course, Tibet is one of the most famous examples of a, of a terrible intolerance. Uh, Xinjiang now is, is, I would say, far worse than Tibet in terms of the pressures uh, being brought against the, the, the Muslim Uyghurs there. In very strong Catholic areas, there is now a kind of uneasy balance. Um, there are a lot of Protestant churches, a lot of very evangelical churches, um, because they often preach a form of what's called the prosperity gospel, i.e., if you're a true believer, your, uh, the, vera the, the truth of your belief will be that you do well. And that sits quite well with Chinese uh, notions about wealth and, and fortune and the gods. But it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And Taoism is in a unique position of being protected and treasured uh, by President Xi. Um, he has spoken very warmly about Taoism. Um, we have, for the last 15 years, worked very closely with the Vice President of China, with senior political officials at Taoist events. Um, but they are in an unusual situation. Most religions are finding it pretty tough. Buddhist temples that have no international links are doing okay. Those with international links are finding a lot of curtailments. But it's important to put this perhaps in perspective. People say, well, there's this whole official government program, isn't there, and a government ministry to control religion. You know, it's so communist. And I have to point out, there's been a Chinese government department to control religion since the 5th century AD, so for 1,600 years. Because what the Chinese do know is that religion is capable of producing saints. It is also capable of producing the most horrific monsters. Um, and every major Chinese dynasty, it's never been overthrown by a religious rebellion. But every major Chinese dynasty has been fatally weakened by a religious rebellion against the power of the state um, or the power of that particular um, emperor or dynasty. And then it has been so weak that when the next big peasant rebellion or ideological rebellion has, has happened, the dynasty falls. So there is a complicated historical relationship between faith and state in China. But at the moment, we are slipping um, backwards, I think, to a very controlling, um, manipulative government. But Taoism still is able to speak truth to that power. Sorry, a long answer there. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. I, I, it, does that adequately answer what you wanted to know, Alicia? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Yeah, I also thank you for your openness and insights. Uh, we got another question from Judith Suchanek by the chat, um, or through the chat. chat. Um, thank you very much for your great speech. Would 
Uh, I would like to ask how you think that we could get the Western people who don't have a specific relation to Chinese or Asian culture to integrate those pre precious thoughts into their own life and to get a feeling for this kind of perception of the world. Hmm. That's a very good question again. Um, I think, I think one, of, one of the problems with the way that we in the West approach many Asian traditions, and I've worked with every major religion in the world for the last almost 40 years, is that we like to take the sort of um, pious meditative bit but we don't necessarily want it to change how we behave. So uh, I remember one of the Taoist masters, oh no, actually it was a Hindu master uh, where, who we worked with on, on um, the Bhumi project, which is the big Hindu environment organization in India. And uh, I remember her saying, you know, um, the problem with just focusing on meditation is that you feel wonderful after an hour of meditation on your yoga mat and chanting quietly, and then you get up and you go out and you try to catch a taxi and there aren't any, and then you have to get a bus and you give the bus driver, a, I don't know, a, a 50 euro note, and he says, no, no, if you haven't got change, you have to get off. And the whole meditation thing collapses because it hasn't actually prepared you to deal with conflict and with struggle, and with change. And I think we run the danger often in taking out of Asian culture the bits that sound terribly nice on a sort of misty evening uh, when we want to think deep thoughts. And that's good, but it needs to be practical. And the way that the Taoists often talk about this is that you have to start with something you actually have some control over. And so their mantra, their kind of core approach to this is to say, you can change the world one meal at a time. Now, what do they mean by that? What they mean by that is what you eat, you buy. What you buy creates a market. What the market says is needed is what drives the farmers or the horticulturalists or whatever section of, of the food market you want. If you decide, based on this wisdom of a balance, that we are here to balance um, these great forces of yin and yang, the great forces that create the food that we eat, then you have to think about the choices you will make about organic, about fair trade, about free range. Uh, Taoists are not vegetarian. There is a vegetarian tradition in Taoism, but they're not vegetarian. But no life should be taken at the cost of the well-being of those species at all. That is completely against Taoist teachings. So they would say, start with what you buy. You can control that. And if enough of you decide to buy organic, you will create a market. And if you create a market, you create a demand, and that creates jobs in that world. And one of the most interesting examples of this is that in the United Kingdom, um, we have the Methodist Church, which is one of the Protestant churches. And they came to a meeting um, at which the Taoists spoke about this. And they had been running a, um, a student hostel for something like 70 years. Uh, but they'd done it very cheaply. They'd done it. They hadn't thought about the food. They hadn't thought about anything. They hadn't thought about the, the materials for the bedding. They hadn't thought about the materials for the rebuilding of the, of the hotel. Inspired by the Taoists, they invested in a fully um, ethical hotel. All their food is ethically sourced. All the building materials, all their energy is ethically sourced. And they are now the only fully ethical hotel in Britain. Why? Because as Christians, they were challenged by the Taoists to think about where they fitted in to the flow of nature. So I, that would be my answer. Start with the food, start with what you buy, because what you buy tells the world what you think is important. Thank you. Not at all. May I ask something? Please, please do. Uh, thank you very much for this very um, 
yeah, bridge um, speech. Um, I have, um, we were actually uh, discussing Maya and I with another group, uh, the, the Zhuangzi right now. Oh. And the chapter we are discussing is about uh, slaughtering an animal and um, doing it in kind of a Wu Wei manner. Mm -hmm. And we were, we are all vegetarians. Yeah, and we were <laughs> yep, right. <laughs> mentioned, uh, so much about uh, needing to harmonize and not taking from the nature and being a part of the nature, being animals ourselves. Like, how do Taoists really see um, the the animal world? This is one question, and the other is. Is there a deep difference between how Hindus or Buddhists see the the cycle of life, where they also partially are vegetarian because they think like we get reborn as animals? Like, is I I don't really quite remember how the Taoists see the, that after death before birthing. So that's like two parts of this question. Hope this is not too much. No, no, it's a very good set of questions, and and you know I'm. I'm very amused by the thought of a group of vegetarians studying the chopping up. It's all about how the butcher uses the blade, isn't it? And he follows the Wu Wei. Yes. We don't want to put people off reading the Zhuangzi, by the way. There's lots of non-chopping up animal bits in it as well. I think um, Taoism sees that everything here is interconnected, not by not interacting, but by interacting. So. Um, there are animals here for us to eat. Um, but as that wonderful 10-year-old boy pointed out, mosquitoes wouldn't do very well if they didn't have our blood to drink, even though that sometimes kills us. So there is a sense that this is a world in which there is give and take. Yin and yang is about give and take. It's not about harmony. I think this is one of the great fallacies in Western thinking about yin and yang. It's not. Yin would love to take over the world and there only to be winter. And Yang would love to take over the world and there would only be summer. And those two great primal myths of the great flood and the, and the nine suns captures that tension. So it's not that there is an absolute good. It is more that there is always a balance between the give and the take. And, and the give and the take is that in, in many of the Taoist stories, human beings are expendable. I'll tell you a wonderful story. This is one of my absolute favorite stories. And Taoism is full of stories, as you know from the Zhuangzi. Um, and have you come yet to the bit where uh, Carpenter Shi um, finds this huge tree in the forest? Have you come to that bit in Zhuangzi yet? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah. I think we are in chapter three now. Um, oh, okay. You've got a way to go yet. <laughs> there's a wonderful story. So there's this carpenter called Carpenter Shi who is famous. He was the great carpenter, the carver, the wood carver, the builder of ancient China. And he's walking through a forest with um, his disciples because he's, he's like a master. And they come to this enormous tree. And I can't quite remember, but I think it's something like if 80 people linked hands around it, they still wouldn't get right round the circumference of the tree. And the, the disciples of this great carpenter look at this tree and they go, oh, wow. Oh, just think how many, uh, how many buildings you could make from that. How many statues can make? How many doors you can make? How many boats you can make? Wow. And Carpenter Shi just goes, no, it's useless. This is terrible wood, totally useless. And they wander on. That night, he's in bed, half asleep, and the tree comes to see him. And the tree is absolutely furious. He says, how dare you dismiss me as useless? that my wood is not good for making your boats and your doors and your door frames and your temples and all the rest of it, he said. It's only because I'm useless that I'm still here. And I found that very useful for me. So don't you dare tell me that I'm useless. 
because it's only by being useless to you that I'm still here. So that wonderful sense of when everything is not here for us, but we are here to be part of this bigger scene. You have to see the, the, the animal element in that as well. I mean, they, you know, that mar marvelous story of Zhuang Tzu saying, you know, did the turtle want to be killed and have its shell worshipped for a thousand years? No, the turtle wanted to go on living. There is a natural cycle. The part of that natural cycle is that things are eaten, things decay, things fall apart. But there is not, Taoism had no notion of reincarnation. Uh, it still doesn't really. It has the notion of being an immortal, but that's a whole other sequence I, I won't go into now, um, but can do if people want to go into that. Um, and it is the only religion in the world that believes you can achieve immortality, but only if you have a physical body that becomes immortal. So there is this very fluid sense of a, of a relationship between becoming part of the stars again, or being able to continue in your physical form through stardust, which is what you live in anyway. But um, it, it is, yeah, there, there is, and it's interesting because um, there is only one vegetarian Buddhist tradition in China. The rest are, are meat eating. Um, and of course the Buddha died choking on a piece of pork um, because the Buddhist tradition is you, you ate what you were given. Uh, vegetarianism is quite a later development within Buddhism. But yeah, I'm, I, <laughs> I don't know if that helps you with the chapter with lots of blood and bits of limbs being chopped up. No, thank you. That was very helpful. We actually had some similar tree uh, um, metaphor in, in the first chapter. Yes, yes, you would have done. Yes, there's the great tree of the universe. Someone yeah. Someone who was complaining about a tree that wasn't useful for him and the other one who would, like the master who would tell him that this tree, and it was very similar. How very it similar. It, it, it's a, it's a theme that runs through a lot of, of, of Taoist thought. Yeah, love it. And thank you so much for talking about the immortality. That was really something uh, I would like to read more about. Um, that concept sounds like very unique. Yes, um, the, 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 the whole, I mean, the, the word immortal is very interesting in itself because the Chinese character um, shows a, a person alone on a mountain. And to be alone was something that Confucianists thought was just dreadful. Confucianists were all about politics and family and patriarchy and hierarchy and obedience and, you know, blah, blah. and the Taoist just kind of went, ah, oh, stuff it, forget it. This, I, just gonna, I just wanna go wander on a mountain and become inspired. And um, it's, it's a deep threat to the sort of collegiate, the, the collective sense of Chinese culture, but fundamentally important is this belief that there are some people who achieve immortality um, and are able to live forever. And there's, there's eight particular figures called the Eight Immortals. And there is a book that I've, I've done. I've done a translation of the key stories of the Eight Immortals of China, which I, th I think you might enjoy. Um, they are mischievous. They are anarchic. They are countercultural. Um, there is a transgender person in there. There is a, a bureaucrat who sees the error of his ways. Uh, it, it, it is an astonishing collection of stories that celebrates exactly what Taoism wants you to appreciate, the absolutely fabulous diversity of the world that we inhabit. So worth looking up, yeah. And if we've got time, I'll tell you my favorite immortal story, but I'm, I'm conscious that Maya may be wanting you all to be able to get home or stay home or have dinner or <laughs> or whatever it is that helps Bergens do listen to music, I presume. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the time is already over and I wanted to ask if there's a last question, but um, yeah, if everybody's fine, of course, you can still tell us. <laughs> <laughs> then we will end the session. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you my favorite story. Um, 
so there is uh, 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 one of the eight immortals who, who you will see depicted on all kinds of Chinese art. In fact, I've, I've got him here. I don't know how much you'll be able to see this character, but this is a one bit of the... Higher. Sorry? A bit higher. Like that? Ah, is yes. Good. Well, this is a wonderful character called Ti Kui Li. Now, Ti Kui Li was, um, is, was a very, very handsome young man, a very arrogant young man. And he decided that he would study to become an immortal. He would go and live on a sacred mountain and he would study to be an immortal so that he could preserve his beautiful body and his beautiful physique and his beautiful face so he would bring happiness to the women of the world forever. He was a very arrogant young man. So off he trots to a sacred mountain and he has a disciple who comes to help him who's not very bright, but he quite likes not very bright people because they don't go, isn't that a bit stupid to think that actually people want to see you all the time anyway. So he meditates for year after year after year and he achieves a certain level where he can do um, astral travel. Now, astral travel is in Taoism when you can leave your body and you can go um, as a spirit, not dead, but as a spirit around the world. Um, and then you come back into your physical body. So it's a very, and, and it's, it's, I've seen it. It's, it's extraordinary to, to witness. So he's reached a stage at which he can do this. And, but the thing is, he can, you can only leave your body for seven days, literally to the, to the minute. If you are not back in your body, one minute after the seventh day is finished, the body rots. It's, it's, the body has actually died. And you are without a home and you can't go into immortality without a physical body. So one day he decides to go off on an astral travel and he tells his disciple, sit by the body. You have to have somebody sit by the body because otherwise the, the ravens come and pick out the eyes or the magpies go and you know, nibble the toes or the foxes rip out his stomach and all the rest of it. So, so he had, the disciple has to sit there and protect the body. And off he goes, astrally traveling around the world, um, bringing happiness, no doubt, to countless women because he's so beautiful. That's what he thinks anyway. Major crisis. On the, on the final day, people run up the mountain to the disciple and say, quick, quick, your mother is dying. You've got to come now and see her. So he's torn between the Confucianist virtue of being a filial son, of, 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 of you know, honoring the mother and the father, and watching over the, his master's body. So he's, he's absolutely tormented and he kind of looks at, at, at the watch or the timekeeper and he goes, oh God, oh. and he's, he's got the time wrong. He thinks that it's almost the end of the seventh day. Whereas in fact, there is another hour and a half to go. But when it gets to what he thinks is the end of the seven days and the master hasn't returned, he thinks, okay, I can go now, but I can't leave the body here because that's awful. So he sets fire to the body and rushes down the hill to see his mum. And then Ti Kui Li kind of drifts back. He's had a nice time. He's, you know, he's visited people all around the world and had a gorgeous spiritual time. And he gets back. And where's his body? There's just a, a, a smoldering heap of burnt ashes. There's no body. And the time is running out. He's cut it very close. He's got three minutes. It's very arrogant. Three minutes. He's got to find another body. And he's whizzing round this mountain, looking desperately. And then he sees in a ditch a body. And he, he rushes into it with about 30 seconds to go. And kind of goes, oh, Whew. wow, that was close. Then he tries to get up. And he finds it almost impossible to get up. He, 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 one leg is withered. He can't, he can't even rest on it. And, and as for his back, he's got a hunchback. He's, 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 what the hell have I got into? What kind of body am I in? And he hobbles over eventually to a pond and looks in and kind of goes, ah! Because he is hideous. 
He's got a distorted face with warts and, you know, lumps and, ah, he's in the body of a, of a, of a crippled, hunchbacked, hideous beggar. And that is the body he's going to have to live in for eternity. So not as the great, handsome, beautiful young man, but as this crippled, hideous beggar. And what does that do? After an initial period where he is beside himself with rage, sadness, bewilderment, he stumbles down the mountain and people start treating him as though he is a handicapped, a disabled beggar with a hideous face. They beat him, they throw things at him, uh, they snatch food away from him. And so he becomes, in the Taoist pantheon of immortality, the defender of the poor, the defender of the disabled, the defender of those who are not beautiful by human standards. And that's how he goes through life. And the great stories about Ti Kwai Li are his, how he uses his great powers as an immortal to bring down the mighty and to raise up the weak. Wonderful stuff. Wonderful stuff. Do read them. It's just gorgeous stories. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I also already read some stories about the eight immortals and I really would also uh, give like... I would say anybody who is interested should do that too. <laughs> and yeah. great that you wrote a book about, like you translated a book. Um, yes, translated all the main stories into English. I, I don't know if it's come out in German. I'm not sure, but um, there we go. Yeah. So, Martin, thank you very, very much oh. for your great talk. And all the participants also thank you for being here. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I can't imagine to have somebody better <laughs> to talk about. That's this. very kind of you. It's been a very great privilege. Maya, has been a lovely thing working with you, developing this. And thank you, everybody, for such good questions. And, um, yeah, do read... Uh, Zhuangzi, I, I translated him. Uh, it's in the Penguin Classics series. He is full of the most outrageously funny stories. He's a postmodernist. He pushed his language till it collapses. Um, and he is just cryingly funny. <laughs> yeah, this is also many religious texts. <laughs> this is also an invitation to uh, participate in our Zoom Cafe, our philosophical Zoom Cafe. We still have uh, four dates, like the next one is next Wednesday, and we will talk about uh, this story about <laughs> it, we How is about the uh, <laughs> butcher of the cook. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, 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 indeed. Yes, indeed. That will be yeah, fun. Who wants to discuss about who is well, very welcome to join. And um, yeah. So, yeah, we, I wish we to everybody... German, so if uh, anyone who speaks or understands German is, is welcome, because we will... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good... 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time, uh, this Wednesday, the 11th, on this channel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, have a lovely weekend, everybody. Yeah, uh, to you all, and, too. Uh, keep safe in these strange... And, and, and troubling times. Um, but uh, there are some wonderful stories to get us through these rough times as well. Thank mm -hmm. you all very, very much indeed for, for, for coming tonight. I'm very touched. Maya, again, a huge thank you to you. Thank you so much. And thank I will you. take with uh, your advice to tell more stories, I think. Oh, I'd be delighted to. Love telling stories. All right. God bless. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>